Sangeeta, it is yeah. five minutes Shall past I... seven. I'll start. You can hear me, no? Yeah, very clearly. Yes. yes. Okay. So, hi everyone. Welcome to clinical learning series. This is Sangeeta. And uh, this is an overwhelming response. So, thanks everyone to... You know, who joined here. Uh, clinical learning series is a platform which would be useful to be a doctor in a low resource center when we start working just after MBBS. So our friends and I, we have this experience of being little lost in a hospital after our MBBS training with huge responsibility of any patient who is walking in. So we also could not and did not make time for accessing the right material to update ourselves and from time to time it happened. So we just started this conversation casually to come up with a series of webinars for evidence-based medicine at primary and secondary care level to many of our doctor friends who are working in different systems, be it NGO or government or private or mission hospital or whatever. So the need as we acknowledge is because of the gap between evidence and experience-based medicine wherein we, we feel little lost, you know, being responsible for patients as well, in a place especially without specialist care. So before going into the presentation, I just want to thank everyone again who has attended this. And we want to, you know, uh, record a few things. One is we are just a group of friends who are trying to do this, who are trying to get a solution. We hope we learn along the way. So kindly bear with any inconveniences in the beginning. The topics of the first few lectures have been decided and we'll definitely respond to the topics that you feel are needed in your setup. Please reach us regarding the same. Each presentation is done by one MBBS doctor helped by an advisor who is a specialist or a research person in the concerned topic and it will be followed by a small discussion and a question answer session. Uh, we know that we won't be able to cover all the questions in one session. So what we decided is we'll create a Google document and circulate in the group. And whoever who want to ask questions can ask questions in the next two days. And we will come up with the answer document within maybe a week or 10 days. So by the next presentation happens, we try to make sure that we will, uh, you know, we will put the presentation and the question answer document and whatever guidelines we use into one folder so that anybody can access it anytime. And it will be, you know, uh, put out to all our friends. Uh, one more very important thing is, uh, ours is mainly clinically based. So this is mainly for doctors who are actually working in a place and not focused on people who are preparing for final year examination or need PG. So specific MCQ based questions, please use other platforms which are like quite plenty right now available and we want to restrict our question answer session to people who are actually working in these places so for now we have kept the whatsapp platform uh, admin only just because we are starting out we will definitely open it to everyone soon and uh, i think i have covered everything that we wanted to say now over to the presenters i just want to introduce the presenters today. Today, our topic is snake bite and management and use of anti snake venom. Uh, the presenter is Dr. Savitri. She is from Chennai. She studied in Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Seva Gram, and she went on to work in Shahid Hospital, Chhattisgarh, which is a rural hospital. Savitri is also involved in Medical Friend Circle, Umeta Foundation, Go to People Movement, and many activities around health for all in the country. And Savitri is helped by advisor, Dr. Hrishikesh Munshi from Varda. He did MBBS and MPH from Sri Chitra Trivandrum. And he worked in Gatsroli, Maharashtra for three years. He is now in ICMR for two years. His areas of interest are tribal health, health inequities, and biostatistics. Uh, he is now chosen as advisor and he has agreed to help us. And he's also the project manager for ICMR in current national snake bite project. So thanks to both of you and thanks to everyone. And over to you, Savitri. Thank you, Sangeeta. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, 
I'm really happy to see that uh, so many of us uh, are here. And uh, I thank you all for coming. And I would like to go ahead now and share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. And it's in presentation mode, right? No. No. Okay. Please hold on. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Savitri and I am going to be presenting briefly about the approach and management of snake bite. So I would like to uh, begin this with a small story of sorts to put the issue into perspective. Uh, basically, I had the opportunity to visit a small home in rural Maharashtra uh, of, of tribal family. In the family around a year back, there was a 10 year old kid who uh, was bitten by something which he could not understand what it was while he was playing in the fields with his friends. So at that point, he and his friend decided that they would go to a village healer who lives near his home and uh, seek care from him. So they went to him and they told him that the boy has been bitten by a scorpion. The village healer said, Ray, you're a small child, go home and bring an adult with you, then I will treat you. So the boy went home. His mother was out fetching water for the family. His father was intoxicated with alcohol and lying in the bed. And the father was not willing to listen to him. He waited for a while for the mother to come back, meanwhile feeling sick. Once the mother was back and he told them something had bitten him and that he's feeling not feeling well, they found out that something is wrong. So they went to a primary health center near their home after waiting for some time to arrange a transport. At the primary health center, they were referred to the sub-district hospital again after some delay for getting an ambulance. By the time he reached the sub-district hospital, he was pretty critical. So at this point, he was referred to the medical college, which was around 60 kilometers away. So he again underwent a delay of three, four hours and reached the medical college somewhere in the wee hours of the night. By the time the boy was only fit for resuscitation and the father still remembers seeing them, seeing the doctors pressing on his chest multiple times before being declared dead. And once the boy died, the, the doctor said we would have to do a post-mortem examination to determine what caused the death. A postmortem was done and tissue samples were sent for toxicology analysis, never to be heard of again. So basically, the boy received a report with no cause of death. And this is important because in this region of Maharashtra, there is a scheme which ensures that the family can receive some compensation if a child dies. Right? However, because they didn't have any documentary evidence of snake bite, the family is still running from pillar to post looking for this particular compensation amount, which would mean a lot to them given that they are landless laborers. So I just mentioned the story to put in perspective that snake bite, like any other health problem, has several socioeconomic determinants which cause the condition as well as the mortality. So why to discuss this topic? Because snake bite has an annual incidence of 11 to 17 lakhs a year in our country, with approximately 60,000 people dying from envenomations every year. So WHO, the World Health Organization, has placed snake bite as a high priority neglected tropical disease. So of all the causes that I mentioned in my story earlier, uh, one of the key strategies to reduce the mortality is training of health workers and ensuring that they have the adequate knowledge and confidence to treat snake bites at, their, at the primary level so that mortality can be prevented. So when it comes to the snakes in India, there are 300 species of snakes in India, of which 52 have been identified to be poisonous. And these belong predominantly to the families Elapidae, Viperidae, 
and hydrophidae, which are basically the sea snakes. So of all these 52 venomous species of snakes, four species are known to cause more than 90% of the envenomations. And these are infamously known as the big four. And I will be discussing a little bit in detail about these snakes because once in a while you might get this patient who comes to you complaining that he or she has been bitten by a snake and carry a bag along with them in which they've brought the dead snake. You may have to look at it and identify the snake because often identification of the snake proves key to predicting the complications that can come from the envenomation. So if at all you feel adventurous enough to examine the snake, please remember to wear gloves because many snakes are venomous even after they are dead. So coming to the first of these big four, the common crate, also scientifically known as Bangaras ceruleus. More important than scientific name for us is the local name of the snake. So it would be a good idea to work into uh, ask the people around you and find out the local names of the snake is called by because when a patient comes to you with a history after having identified the snake he would he or she would tell you in the local language and it would be important that you identify the snake so the common crate can be identified by its black body and white bands what needs to be remembered is that there are no white bands on the neck of the snake this is important because there is this very similar looking snake which is non-poisonous, which also has white bands on its neck. The common crate is a neurotoxic snake, meaning the venom of the common crate acts on the presynaptic terminal, in the neuromuscular junction. So what happens is in the neuromuscular junction, there are acetylcholine vesicles. The venom of the common crate, also known as a bangarotoxin, it depletes these acetylcholine vesicles and damages the terminal, causing muscle paralysis, which eventually causes diaphragmatic paralysis leading to respiratory failure and death. So this is a neurotoxic snake bite. Common crate are infamous for night bites. If you get a patient who comes to you and says, I was sleeping and something bit me, a snake, and now I'm feeling so, 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 you can suspect that it was a common crate bite. If you get a patient with symptoms of envenomation with no history of snake bite, but the patient did not recognize that he was even bitten by a snake, once again, you can suspect common crate because the fangs of the snake are as thin as a hypodermic needle. So if they bite you, you may not even realize, you may mistake it for a mosquito bite or any other bite, or you may not even realize that you have been bitten. So common crate is infamous for night bites and occult bites, which are bites without the explicit history of snake bite. Coming to the famous cobra, the Naja Naja. Cobra is pretty simple to identify because it has a hood with a spectacle mark. There are also snakes with different marks other than the characteristic spectacle. Uh, this is also a neurotoxic snake bite, but the difference here is it's a postsynaptic toxin. What it means is that the action of the venom is that it goes and competitively inhibits the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So the importance of this is that if we have an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor drug, for example, neostigmine, this can have some benefit in cobra bite envenomation. Cobras bite early in the morning or in the evenings and sometimes even in the day. And cobra bites are characterized by extensive local necrosis. The fatal dose of the venom is 120 milligrams. Coming to the Russell's viper. Russell's viper, Daboya Russelli, is infamous in the sense that it is known as a farmer killer. It is one of the snakes that farmers get bitten by predominantly when they're working in the field among tall grass without adequate protection of their feet. So Russell's viper's venom is vasculotoxic in the sense that it is a procoagulant. It causes the blood to not clot it, is a defib it does defibrination, consumption coagulopathy, and eventually causes DIC. This is also directly vasculotoxic to the vascular endothelium. Russell's viper, like I mentioned earlier, is a day bite, is character characterized by day bite, and the fatal dose of the venom is 150 milligrams. So this is the picture of a Russell's viper bite. 
you can see a characteristic symptoms which i'll be describing later on and the person identifying that this was the snake that bit him coming to the saw scaled viper a close resembler to the russell's viper this also has a triangular head and it is also a vascular toxic snake this also has predominantly day bites and the fatal dose of the venom is 80 mg coming to the presentation of snake bite first thing we need to remember is that any patient that comes to you with suspected or confirmed snake bite should ideally be admitted for 24 hours to observe for symptoms because there have been records of snake bite and venomation symptoms appearing as late as 24 hours one thing we need to remember while taking history of snake bite is that there have been certain incidences where patients do not describe the snake bite as snake bite per se in some people there is a belief that if a person utters the words i have been bitten by a snake the envenomation is exacerbated so they might choose to use other euphemisms for snake bite like uh, i have been betrayed or something dangerous has happened or etc it may be interesting to find out if there are any such euphemisms in the area that you may practice also like i mentioned earlier it's important to know the local names of the snakes once the patient has given you a history of snake bite it is important to find out how much time has elapsed since the snake bite what the victim was doing at the time of the bite because as we saw the circumstance of the bite may point towards the snake a brief medical history and what are the symptoms at presentation this is important because the symptoms will point towards a type of envenomation if it's neurotoxic or if it's hemotoxic and of course guide the treatment of complications we need to provide supportive treatment to the patient and observe for signs of envenomation in supportive treatment i would like to mention that if the patient is in a lot of pain kindly avoid giving nsaids for pain relief because as we will see ahead some snake bites have the complication of acute kidney injury so we do not want nsaids given parenterally just before these complications develop and the second thing is that we need to give a tetanus toxoid injection depending on the immunization schedule that the patient has been on because it has been observed that tetanus uh, does reside in the fangs of the snake uh, there is a concept called dry bite so we just saw that among the 50, uh, 300 species only 52 are poisonous and four are the grade four even among these poisonous uh, snakes there is a concept of dry bite that is a snake will bite but do not inject any venom into the body so we need to observe for symptoms and only then ascertain that envenomation has happened just before, just because a patient has been bitten by a venomous snake does not necessarily say that uh, the patient has been injected with venom so 10 to 80 percent bites have been found to be dry bites and once in a while the patient would be extremely anxious because they have been bitten by a snake and everybody knows that snake bite can be fatal so they may come in with symptoms of anxiety palpitations tachycardia sweating dilated pupils so these symptoms may often be confused with symptoms of envenomation that is why it's very important to reassure the patient to tell them that you have come to the right place we will take care of you or we will make sure that you are transferred to the right place so don't be afraid so this is important because we do not want to confuse symptoms of envenomation with anxiety related symptoms so coming to the symptoms of snake bite there are four clinical syndromes that are associated with snake bite and venomation the very first is a neuroparalytic progressive weakness syndrome which is seen in crate and cobra bites so in a crate bite it may develop anywhere from 6 hours to 24 hours after the bite and in cobra within half an hour to 6 hours after the bite so we need to remember that neuroparalysis in case of snake bite is descending paralysis there is a paralysis starts from above downwards so the very first thing to appear is a ptosis which is basically the incomplete opening of the upper eyelids so ptosis is the very first symptom that we need to look for it eventually progresses to include diplopia dysarthria dysphonia and eventually dyspnea and dysphagia so what we need to identify here is of course the ptosis which is the very first symptom which indicates systemic envenomation 
And we also need to identify if the patient is moving towards respiratory failure. So there are bedside tests which help you to identify is the patient moving towards respiratory failure. One very simple test is the breath holding time. You ask the patient to take a deep inspiration and hold the breath. If the patient can hold his breath for more than 45 seconds, it means that his respiratory system is functioning normally for the moment and therefore impending respiratory failure is unlikely at the moment. Of course, we need to repeat these tests periodically to keep to look for signs of envenomation. One more thing we need to remember in neuropalytic snake bite is that occasionally there may be a patient brought to you with dilated pupils which are fixed. So we know that fixed dilated pupils is a sign of brain death. Whereas in neuropalytic snake bite, it is associated with the paralysis of the pupillary muscles leading to dilated fixed pupil. Therefore, it is not necessarily a sign of brain death. This is important to remember. So this is a picture of ptosis following neuroparalytic snake bite and animation. All Most of the images have been taken from the national uh, standard treatment guidelines for snake bite, which has been put out by the government of India. The next very important uh, syndrome that is associated with snake bite is the vasculotoxic or the hemotoxic bite. As we have seen, this, uh, the viperine venoms, they cause excessive bleeding they don't allow the blood to clot so there are local signs like local swelling bleeding from the wound blistering necrosis swelling leading to compartment syndrome tender enlargement of a local draining lymph node so in this context i would also like to mention that we know that one very popular first aid that patients give themselves in case of snake bite is tying a very tight tourniquet about the wound now, medically speaking, this step is not correct. In fact, it has harms in the sense that it may, uh, it may fasten gangrene. So, tourniquet should not be used in case of snake bite. However, if the patient comes to you with a tourniquet already tied and you see swelling below that, it, it is possible that you may mistake this swelling for signs of local envenomation. On the other hand, if there is uh, if there has been envenomation and if you release a tourniquet immediately, it may cause a bolus of the venom to go into circulation, causing the patient to deteriorate quickly. So the guidelines say that if you have, say, a tourniquet tied at the level of forearm and a patient with snake bite on a finger, so what you do is you tie a blood pressure cuff on the arm and inflate it to around 100 millimeters of mercury start the treatment for snake bite, which is the anti-snake venom, and eventually release the tourniquet and very slowly deflate the cuff after some amount of anti-snake venom has gone into the person's circulation. This is just to mention here. Coming back to the vasculotoxic systemic signs of envenomation. So any kind of visible systemic bleeding, epistaxis, gingival bleeding, hematemesis, all of these are important. Bleeding from the bite site, any petechi, purpura, echimosis, blebs, gangrene. He could even have internal bleeding, that is gastrointestinal or retroperitoneal bleeding, and the dreaded complication of intracranial bleeding. So these are some images which show gingival bleeding, conjunctival edema, and echimosis in case of a Russell's viper bite. Coming to painful progressive swelling, which is seen in Russell's viper bite, saw scale viper bite, and cobra bite. So this is a sign of local necrosis. There is blistering with reddish black fluid and a significantly painful swelling, potentially involving the whole limb and extending onto the trunk. So in this case, I would like to mention that just a swelling around the snake bite wound is not considered as a sign of systemic envenomation. So one common practice is to mark the swelling. Say a patient presents to you saying that I've been bitten by a snake and look, there's a swelling around. Take a pen and mark the swelling and observe periodically is the swelling proceeding beyond the mark. If it is, then it may indicate a painful progressive swelling, which is a sign of systemic envenomation. So these are examples of an envenomed foot and poisonous snake bite marks. Coming to the last of the syndromes, which is the myotoxic snake bite, which is seen in the sea snake bite, which is, in, which is associated with muscle injury. So there's uh, compartment syndrome, uh, passage of dark brown urine, myoglobinuria, hyperkalemia, which can cause arrhythmias, etc. 
So this is just a summary of what we have just discussed on what to do if a patient comes with an overt bite. It could be asymptomatic, it could be a dry bite, it could be a symptomatic bite and the four different clinical syndromes and what they each indicate. Now coming to general and systemic examination. So in a while, if a patient comes to you and he's vitally unstable, then the patient would immediately require resuscitation and ICU management, which is obvious. Given that the patient is vitally stable, you need to assess the site of the bite and signs of local envenomation every one to two hours. The pulse rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and the 20-minute whole blood clotting test. This I will be discussing in detail in the next slide. It has to be done every hour for the first three hours and every four hours for the remaining 24 hours. We should also look for signs of compartment syndrome. And the signs of compartment syndrome are basically pain on passive movement, paresthesia along the nerves, etc. We need to remember that presence of a pulse does not rule out compartment syndrome. So this is just to reiterate the signs of envenomation. The reason I uh, again and again emphasize on the signs of envenomation is that anti-snake venom is only indicated in the presence of these signs. The reason being anti-snake venom is a precious resource. Anti-snake venom has adverse reactions. So we do not want to give it to a patient who does not need it. At the same time, we should not not give it just because we're afraid of the adverse reactions. So it is important that we all know these signs of envenomation and know how to look for them. Coming to the investigations, the most important bedside clinical low resource investigation for snake bite envenomation is a 20 minute whole blood clotting test. For this, the prerequisite is a clean glass test tube. And by clean, I mean that it should not be one which has been cleaned by a detergent which is being reused. It has to come from a fresh pack. So the, for doing the whole blood clotting test, 2 ml of venous blood is collected from the patient and it is transferred directly into a clean glass test tube very slowly. When you uh, inject the blood from the syringe into the glass tube, it has to be done slowly. Then this tube has to be maintained undisturbed upright in a calm area for 20 minutes at room temperature. I stay calm because we don't want disturbances to shake the tube and affect the results. After exactly 20 minutes, the tube must be tilted. Ideally, if the blood is clotting normally, a solid clot is retained. But if the clot breaks down or there is fluid which is uh, moving, then we know that there is coagulopathy. And this coagulopathy indicates snake bite and venomation, especially viper bites. We need to counsel the patient in the beginning that this test may be repeated. So we may repeatedly go to the patient and collect blood again and again. This, it may be a good idea to tell them right in the beginning. And if the test is negative, that is if the blood is not clotting, we know that it is a hemotoxic snake bite and the test then needs to be repeated six hours later after we have treated the bite with anti-snake venom. Investigations, other investigations. So we could do blood counts. So in blood counts, it's important to remember that there may be anemia in case of severe bleeding. There may be thrombocytopenia again in viper bites. And it has been seen that uh, Neutrophil leukocytosis is also affected with systemic, is also associated with systemic envenomation. Maybe a good idea to group the blood, especially if you feel that the patient has lost a lot of blood and will require a transfusion. Renal function tests need to be monitored because viperine bites have been shown to cause acute kidney injury. For the same reason, we would also do a urine dipstick for protein and blood. PT, APTT will also indicate if it is available in your setting. Uh, defective clotting of the blood. In addition, there are peripheral smear findings, urine microscopy findings, pulmonary function tests, arterial blood gas, especially in patients with respiratory paralysis, CKMB and echo because some snake bites have also been shown to cause cardiomyopathy and USG to detect internal bleeding in abdomen. Of course, these tests are based on availability and it is important to use investigations prudently and to know 
what we are looking for before we prescribe the investigation. Coming to the treatment, the anti-snake venom. So as a lot of us know, anti-snake venom is basically equine antibodies against the snake venom. So what they do is they collect venom from these big four snakes, inject it into horses and collect their serum plasma and purify it and bring out this anti-snake venom. So anti-snake venom is basically antibodies produced in the horse's body. We need to remember that if ASV is indicated, that is if signs and symptoms of envenomation are present with or without laboratory tests, anti-snake venom must always be administered in full dose, which is 10 vials. Second thing is there are no absolute contraindications to anti-snake venom. Anti-snake venom is life-saving and if a patient needs it, it is always a good idea to go ahead and give it. Pregnant women and children are treated in exactly the same way as any other victims. Because we need to remember that the amount of anti-snake venom is dependent on how much venom has been injected by the snake in the body. And that is not dependent on if the person is a pregnant woman, a child or an adult. So the dose for anti-snake venom in children is the same as in adults. And pregnant women is also the same as in adults. So the dose for anti-snake venom. Those for anti-snake venom in neuroparalytic snake bite is initially we have to give 10 vials of the anti-snake venom as an infusion over 30 minutes, wait for an hour and look at the symptoms again. If there is no improvement within one hour, repeat a second dose of 10 vials. For vasculotoxic snake bites, there are two therapies. The low dose infusion therapy, which is 10 vials for Russell's viper or six vials for saw scale wiper. But I would suggest there is that we exercise caution here because we need to be absolutely sure that it's a saw scale wiper. There is no harm to giving 10 vials even in case of saw scale wiper envenomation. So unless you're 100% sure that it's saw scale wiper, go for 10 vials. Again, is infusion over 30 minutes, followed by two vials every six hours is infusion in 100 ml of normal saline till clotting time normalizes. So every six hours, we would repeat a whole blood clotting test, look at the clotting. If it's abnormal, give two while infusion. So this goes on for three days or until the clotting time normalizes, whichever is earlier. There's also a high dose intermittent bolus therapy. This is very much dependent on the availability of anti-snake venom. So if there is abundant anti-snake venom available in your setting, you could consider giving this. Now, how to give the anti-snake venom? So the anti-snake venom in most of our settings is in the form of a powder. So this powder has to be reconstituted by adding 10 ml of either normal saline or sterile water. And these 10, 10 vials of such reconstituted anti-snake venom is dissolved in 100 ml of distilled water and added to 400 ml of normal saline. Of course, with children, the fluid uh, doses can be adjusted. We need to mention the date and time of starting the infusion and add the uh, vials into the NS and start the infusion. So 10 vials in the first hour and maintain a slow drip for 24 hours. So we need to remember that once we reconstitute the anti-snake venom, it has to appear like this. It has to be clear. If it appears opaque or translucent in any way, this has to be discarded. So a turbid solution of reconstituted ASV must be discarded. And we also need to remember that when we reconstitute ASV, it has to be done by gentle swirling and not by vigorous shaking. At this point, it's also important to mention that anti-snake venom, the cost of anti-snake venom is a problem in many areas. It costs anywhere between 500 rupees to 3000 rupees for five vials. And uh, as we just mentioned, a patient needs at least 10 vials as a starting dose. So if it may be a good idea to review what the policies are in your hospital. Is anti-snake venom covered under any insurance policies? Is the patient eligible for it, et cetera? And this is also another reason why we would not give it in a patient who does not need it because it is really expensive. And I'd also like to mention that there are other venomous snakes in our country, except the big four, against whom the anti-snake venom does not work. 
So we may hope for some cross reaction and give anti snake venom, but there are no logical basis to accept expect that anti snake venom will work against all the venomous snakes. So there may be regional snakes in your area which are venomous and who whose bite cannot be treated by anti snake venom. Coming to ASV reactions. These are some of the dreaded complications, the fear of which prevents people from giving anti-snake venom even to deserving patients. So in this regard, I would like to mention this first practice, which is the ASV test dose. ASV test dose is given by many people in the hope that it will indicate if the patient is hypersensitive towards ASV. But there is ample evidence to say that ASV test dose does not predict anaphylactic reaction. Also, it may even sensitize the patient and cause anaphylactic reaction eventually. So it is a bad idea to do ASV test dose and it's contraindicated to do it. Coming to the reactions, there are early anaphylactic reactions, there are pyrogenic reactions and late serum sickness type of reactions. So 20 to 60% of patients will develop some mild reactions and severe life-threatening anaphylaxis is rare. So the early reaction is seen in 10 to 180 minutes. It's caused, uh, it is characterized by itching, urticaria, abdominal pain, tachycardia, etc. The pyrogenic reaction is not per se a reaction to the ASV, but to contaminants which may be in the ASV or in the IV line or the fluid that you used. It is seen as fever, chills, hypotension, one to two hours after treatment. The late reaction is seen one to 12 days after the treatment. This is seen uh, from anything as simple as fever to as severe as encephalopathy can be seen as a late reaction. So basically, it's important to monitor when you're giving ASV. So any new sign or symptom that the patient says after starting an ASV drip should be suspected as a reaction. And all patients should be watched carefully every five minutes for the first 30 minutes, then 15 minutes for two hours for manifestation of a reaction. The practicality is again dependent on the manpower of the setting. If you work in an area where you do not have enough manpower, it may be very difficult to monitor patients at this frequency. It is again a good idea to keep the patient close to the nursing station and to have more trained personnel who can do this monitor. So this is an example of uh, an acute skin reaction following. Savitri, Savitri sorry to interrupt. 30 minutes. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I'm almost done. Yeah, just to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how to treat this ASV reaction? Stop the ASV, give oxygen, start fresh IV normal saline with a new IV set. And the most important treatment is adrenaline, 0.5 milligrams intramuscular over the deltoid or over the thigh and chlorpheniramine malleate and as 10 milligram intravenously. And if it is a late serum sickness type of reaction, we can again give injection chlorpheniramine six hourly for five days. So we need to remember here that hydrocort role is not really proved in ASV reaction management. There is some evidence from a trial in Sri Lanka which suggests that pre-medication with 0.25 milligram of adrenaline subcutaneously may prevent ASV reactions without causing any additional side effects. So several guidelines have now started including pre-medication with adrenaline 0.25 milligram subcutaneously to prevent ASV reactions. In case of neuroparalytic snake bites, respiratory paralysis is a dreaded complication. So in those patients, in addition to ASV, there is something known as the atropine neostigmine trial. So what we do is we give atropine 0.6 milligram followed by neostigmine 1.5 milligram IV and repeat the dose as neostigmine 0.5 milligram and atropine every 30 minutes for five doses. And majority of the patients would improve in this five doses. This is, of course, in addition to the assisted ventilation that we would be giving the patient. So to see if the patient would require ventilation, this is one of the characteristic criteria known as a broken neck sign. When the patient is lifted from the bed by the shoulder. If they're unable to hold up their neck, it is indicating that the paralysis is descending to the level of the neck. This is a case of a child in which, in whom... Uh, one hour after the cobra bite with neostigmine and atropine ASV, the child recovered, but 24 hours later, he relapsed into an envenomation, which again required 10 vials of ASV. So this is important to show that the patients need to be monitored even after you have primarily uh, 
treated them with anti snake venom there are some other dreaded complications like shock acute kidney injury myocardial damage etc coming to occult presentations like i mentioned in the beginning in crate bite the, the patient may give very uh, atypical histories like the patient was healthy in the night they get up with severe epigastric and umbilical pain with vomiting so this sounds like an acute abdomen and most doctors tend to treat it as an acute abdomen especially in the absence of a history of snake bite but it's important to remember that if a patient comes early morning with symptoms of acute abdomen snake bite is a valid differential diagnosis especially if it's predominant it's uh, prevalent in your area similarly if children come to you with presence of ptosis sudden onset acute flaccid paralysis this is also suspicious of crate bite envenomation so this is a chart which shows which are the most common symptoms of crate bite envenomation it's important to note that tenderness over abdomen and other muscles is almost as frequent as bilateral ptosis so this is an important slide that i wanted to talk about snake bite is a stressful event in the family especially if it is life threatening it may cause death in spite of your best efforts so in settings such as these and in general in any setting where you need to deliver bad news to a patient and their family there is a protocol in place known as spikes protocol the steps are very simple you never tell the bad news standing in a veranda you try to take the patient to a uh, private setting sit them down and then speak to them first before giving them the bad news assess what they already know that is assess the family's perception allow them ask them open questions like what do you think is wrong with your patient or with your own body then ask them if they want to know the real information this is specifically important in terms of diagnosis with poor prognosis where you ask them if they are ready to hear the news if they agree then you go ahead and tell them what you know but in non technical terms ultimately this is the part we are afraid of that is the patient would show some emotion they would cry they may get angry they may shut down all these emotions are okay and you don't have to do anything you just allow them to express that emotion and wait for the emotion to pass after that you strategize you tell them what the future plans are and be uh, tell them that you care about them and that you would be there to do whatever you can it is important in this setting to remember that we need to believe first to care about the patient only then we would be able to convey it to them and once uh, this type of communication is established it is less likely that the patient would go into uh, events like violence and later on legal complications of course this is in the setting of competent medical care pure communication is not enough and the last thing that i want to talk about are the medico legal aspects like i mentioned in the initial case in many parts of the country snake bite deaths are eligible for compensation given that snake bites are more common in families from villages with agrarian backgrounds this compensation means a lot to these families especially if the person who has died is an earning member so in this case it is important that from our side we do not cause an obstruction of justice so that the patient is unable to avail this compensation so it has to be remembered that under the registration of births and deaths act it is important that a doctor who has treated a patient issue a medical certification of cause of death this form 4a which you may have seen in your hospitals it is important that if you know of the history and if you have seen symptoms of envenomation if you have treated with asv that you can write that it's a snake bite death and once you know the cause the patient need not go through an autopsy in case of autopsy also we need to remember that snake bite as of now can only be diagnosed by the detection of the venom by toxicological process this may or may not happen especially if the patient is presented late to you so it is important that as far as possible you try to give them a clinical mccd so that they can avail the legal compensation that they deserve so most of the content that i have taken are from the standard treatment guidelines which have been put out by the government of india in 2016 in addition i have taken some data from other studies i would be happy to share the document as well as my presentation on the uh, group so like any disease it's important to talk about prevention of snake bite and one of the key thing for that is to train the healthcare workers and also to tell the people what are the preventive strategies for snake bite 
including mosquito nets, using boots while working in farms, etc. So thank you so much for patiently listening and I'm sorry for extending the time. So we can discuss ahead. So Dr. Rishikesh, would you like to take over and talk about a few cases before we open it up for general discussion? Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Uh, perhaps uh, quickly we can go through some of, of some of the cases uh, and uh, so that we have some time for the discussion. Yeah. Uh, so these are certain slides and uh, which we got uh, from Dr. Himmatra Bhavaskar. And these are certain cases of uh, missed diagnosis of snake bite. That uh, now this woman was uh, bitten by the common crate and just below her neck. And so she had a uh, difficult, so she woke up in the morning, she couldn't talk and she had dysarthria also. So initially she went uh, to a MBBS uh, doctor and uh, the doctor examined her and said that this is dysarthria. You must be having uh, some issue with your teeth. So he referred her to a dental practitioner. So from an MBBS doctor, she went to a BDS uh, person and uh, he described her some painkillers and uh, antibiotics. But her condition worsened and within a few hours, she died. So uh, it just tells us that uh, Savitri talked about cockled bites. So it tells us how important history taking is that uh, if the doctor had uh, really asked about uh, whether where she was sleeping, whether what was her condition last night and uh, what were the symptoms she had after the bite, whether she had any other symptoms, including uh, the, the graph we saw, uh, whether she had any abdominal pain or vomiting or other such symptoms. So a good history taking, I think it's the start of uh, uh, the management of snake bite. Next, please. Yes. So we talked of neurotoxic as well as uh, hemotoxic symptoms of various snakes. But uh, there has uh, been, uh, there, there is evidence that uh, some of the snakes, especially the Russell's viper, does show some neurotoxic symptoms as well. So here is a case that uh, was bitten by Russell's viper. So she had bleeding as per the, uh, the, the hemotoxic symptoms. But at the same time, she also had neuroparalytic symptoms similar to a cobra bite. So it is uh, very important for us that when a, a, a case of snake bite comes and we don't know whether uh, it's, a, it's a Russell's viper or a cobra or a crate. Uh, so the 20 minute whole blood clotting test uh, is very important. And uh, to rule out whether uh, what uh, species of snake has uh, bitten the, the the victim. So even though even though this this might was this was she was bitten by the Russell's viper, still the neurotoxic symptoms were there and can be easily be misdiagnosed as a cobra or a great bite. Next, please. Yes. Uh, uh, so this this case was highlighted as it shows that even though snake bite is called a disease of poverty, but still this case is in a way an example that the, the how poverty has saved this person. So this labor woke up with acute pain in abdomen and he went to a surgeon who ordered a UHG. And uh, but before the UHG report could come, the surgeon had to attend the OT. And so he showed the UHG report to another surgeon who advised hospitalization. And uh, but because this guy couldn't afford the hospitalization, they went to a government setup. And in the government setup itself, they were diagnosed that it was actually a great bite. And after uh, ASV infusion, that person got well within within six hours. So perhaps it is a possibility that if he would have stayed uh, there itself, so he would have easily been misdiagnosed with, say, perhaps acute appendicitis. Yes. Next, please. Yes. I think this is the final slide. So uh, we talked, uh, Savitri talked about uh, the wolf snake. So the common crate bite as well as uh, a wolf snake, common crate and wolf snake, they look quite similar to each other. And this is a case of a, uh, a five-year-old, six-year-old boy who was 
beaten by the wolf snake but uh, the physician thought that he was beaten by the common cat and so he referred him he also did the asv test dose on the boy and then he referred him to the district hospital and uh, so there after a lot of history taking and uh, when the uh, doctor at the district hospital saw the photo and he sent the photo to dr bavaskar so it was then confirmed that it was a wolf snake and there was no need at all of giving doing a test dose or giving the asv to the boy so there are certain cases of a uh, misdiagnosis that can happen so it is very important that we identify the snake that has bitten the person and it is again like savitri mentioned it is of utmost importance that we know the local names of the snakes uh, in the area where uh, we are working so the approach to snake bite management actually does not start uh, when the patient reaches us it actually start when we decide say perhaps to go to a place and start working or we get our order to that you have to go here and work so it starts there there is a, there are multitude of factors that affect the snake bite animation socio economic factors it affects the farmer so much that it is sort of on the border line of being called as an occupational disease as well and uh, then there are uh, there is the health uh, system availability the asv availability the in- incompetency of the system and as well as it is very a very important factor that affects snake bite envenomation are the traditional healers so wherever you go you will be encountering these people the traditional healers the priests or the guniyas or the pujaris tantric mantrics whatever they are called as per the area and uh, in multiple uh, fgds and uh, uh, publications have showed that traditional healers still remain the first choice of a uh, snake bite victim and so the 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 point is even though some of them do refer cases that cannot be managed at their place still there is a loss of time so when a patient comes to a health system or it, the patient comes to you a lot of time has already passed so it has so we have to keep that in mind that this has to be treated very urgently then Yes. there is there are certain beliefs uh, that i would like to perhaps share that that uh, yeah, perhaps in the area especially there in the tribal areas so we have done some focus group discussions in maharashtra and odisha and uh, so we uh, found out that even people believe that pats pauli in marathi is called or uh, sapachi maushi or sapsuri it's called so it's a common garden uh, dotted skunk so even people believe that that is a snake so you might also have uh, patients who are bitten by that and people believe that it's called pass fouli because the venom is so strong that you cannot even walk five steps after the it has bitten you in reality it is completely non venomous but you will have certain cases so you have to use uh, uh, your the asv very judiciously you just cannot believe everything uh, what is being told to you you have to take history uh, very stringently before actually giving asv to the victim yes so uh, i guess this was uh, it from our side and perhaps we can have some more discussion on the topic thanks to savitri and rishikesh it was a uh, very useful presentation it was done really well and uh, there were two or three questions in the chat box if we can respond to that first i think nilesh had asked the first question yes uh, okay yes about diagnostic yeah 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 yes 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 uh, so they are uh very honestly the snake bite diagnostic kits are in the making since around 20 years and uh, right, right now uh, snake bite diagnostic kits are only used in australia and uh, in 2019 uh, in coimbatore actually so dr i forgot his name or something vaya uh, pai or something dr vaya pai think he he uh, first of all he started working on on uh, the snake bite diagnostic kits even his student medha sonavne uh, because we had contacted her so they do have a patent also 
for snake bite diagnostic kits however the commercial there is no commercial production a couple of months back only we had contact we tried contacting her uh, if these kits were really available but we she was not contactable and uh, so right now in india itself there are uh, no commercially available snake bite diagnostic kits only Aust- because australia also has species specific uh, anti snake venom so <clears throat> for them it is very important uh, to see what kind of a snake has bitten the person we here we have a polyvalent uh, asv so that looks after the big four so perhaps it would take some more time before this snake bite diagnostic kits are actually uh, available in india so the the patent document is available uh, on the internet you can search by uh, the name of dr medha sonawani Thank you, thank you, Rishikesh, for that. And uh, if we can go to the next question of Shrinidhi had asked, uh, what are the measures that can be done in the community to prevent snake bites? Yes. Yes. Uh, so currently, uh, via ICMR, uh, we are doing two research studies, and uh, one is in Maharashtra and Odisha where. We are trying to, at one point, also uh, the empower the medical officers at the PSCs and the RH and sub district hospitals in both the states by giving them training. So, Dr. Himmat Rao Bhavaskar, Dr. Sadhanand Rao uh, are our national trainers, and we have been taking trainings in Thane as well as Bachiroli. Then, about the community awareness, so we are in the process of developing. Uh, local language locally suitable iec material for the communities in maharashtra and odisha and uh, the point about community awareness is it can be looked at from 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 uh, two two points of view are there one is that they should be aware that what are the preventive methods like savit prevention that is, gum boots should be used but then the point is are they available are they affordable are they convenient to use in the fgd people told that yeah we, we we do have gum boots but we cannot work because once the rain starts or the water gets in the boots the boots get the boots get very heavy so we cannot work so even though it is it is a, the right way of prevention but then there are certain aspects uh, like this which which uh, make it difficult to implement then uh, mosquito nets are there so shrinidhi knows perhaps that uh it is the, the mosquito net distribution for malaria so we have uh, two mosquito nets are given for four people the mosquito net has to be shared by two people and even most of the places where snake bites are quite common people do not have beds or they don't even know how to properly tuck it tuck the mosquito net inside so yes there are certain aspects of uh, we know that they should be done and they should not be done but at the community level it has the this thing this should be very decentralized that in in aheri we were told that we would love to have gumboots and mosquito nets so so perhaps at that place we need to distribute them but then in odisha in, in raigada we did a focus group discussion and uh, they told us that we do not want this because it is uncomfortable so at that place perhaps we uh, should focus on certain other aspects of uh, prevention of snake bite but uh, so it has to be very area specific and uh, so one size fits all approach should not be used especially in case of snake bites thank you for that answer yeah, yeah it is something that we all would want to happen but we don't know how it can be executed for the first yeah. and uh, there is a three part question coming up so so anna has asked three questions the first question is at what interval should whole blood clotting time be repeated during or after infusion to ensure appropriate response so that's the first part of her question yeah yes so uh, the first uh, wbct has to be done immediately once the patient is admitted uh, Uh, at your place then after uh, you start the hsv the the wbct has to be repeated they say hourly at least uh, for the first uh, two hourly for the first six hours so for monitoring because in the first six hours uh, if you go by the protocol you would have 
already given him at least 20 vials give the patient at least 20 vials of uh, asv so uh, repeating it two hourly for six hours and then uh, three six hourly till for 24 hours so that would be a really good way to monitor the uh, progress of the patient the uh, won't give in cpm during asv infusion this mimic neuro venation yeah yeah giving okay okay it's it's a it's a it's a cost benefit thing i guess i mean it's a very practical consideration because we are not currently uh, we are not uh, that much bothered about what would cpm do or side effect that cpm cause because if it's really life saving in case of uh, uh, yes we then perhaps uh, that's okay and we should be aware of it and uh, the dose matters because we are not giving it in very high doses that it would cause it would mimic neuro envenomation perhaps so the dose matters very high doses of cpm might cause but the dose that we are perhaps uh, giving or the protocol mentions about uh, that uh, giving to the snake bite patients uh, the possibility is quite less that it could mimic uh, symptoms of neuro envenomation yeah and, and there is another question location of location of where to put the eye no there is no protocol uh, regarding this the location location doesn't matter at all just that about uh, Sa how what savitri mentioned was about the torniquet so before uh, i would again stress on that point here that though the location of iv line doesn't matter but however uh, you should remember that uh, usually patient come up with a very tight torniquet we were told that the torniquet should be that tight that even air should not pass so it is that tight so before you release that you do uh, start the asv line and then you put a bp cuff and then slowly release it that is the only precaution you have to take nothing with the location So there is one very specific question. After five minutes of ASV, patient experiences redness over abdomen. What should we do? I think specific complications somebody encountered. Yeah, yeah. See redness over the abdomen. Uh, again, it, 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 it's 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 a sign of perhaps uh, there is a reaction to the anti snake venom, and uh, the reaction to anti snake venom can come in from immediately after the infusion infusion till uh, three hours. after the infusion has stopped also so uh, what uh, dr bavaskar has said that it is specifically that you have to the doctor has to be by the bed side of the patient for at least 3 hours of asv infusion so even if it can come at 5 minutes and uh, the management as savitri has described already so you should first of all stop the asv that is the first thing you do because if you are having redness it might be you you should ask if there is itching also whether it is urticaria so the, all these are types of the adverse reaction to asv and uh, savitri perhaps you can again share the the management of anaphylaxis or uh, if we are going to share the ppt anyways then the yeah, i won't be we are going yeah, to yeah. Yes. we are going to share the ppt anyways yes okay okay so the management is there but the first thing you do is you stop the anti venom Abhijit has asked, should we consider yeah. giving atropine neostigmine in all common rate bites? Usually, it's not in indicated because, uh, uh, like like it was mentioned about the pre and the post synaptic where this uh, neuromuscular junction where this venom sac of the cobra and the crate. So atropine neostigmine, though it it is sometimes given in cobra uh, in crate bite, but uh, there is no evidence to say that it causes improvement in the symptoms. this is like what yeah. savitri also said no i think you are telling yeah. the same yes yes better to give but we are not very sure of yeah how i mean there is no evidence like to to say that it improves okay, it, okay. yeah yeah okay so and there are two questions about normal whole blood clotting time yeah we can answer both one is uh, whole blood clotting time is normal and there are no cnsas but there is only progressive swelling then what do we do and the normal whole blood clotting time but ptinr is prolonged then what do we do so two questions by two different people so just 
Yes. So, uh, second question. Even though the WBCT is normal and still there is a prolonged PT INR, but still ASV has to be indicated, and it it it, it also depends not just on the lab investigations, but we'll also look have to look at the symptoms. What are the symptoms? Is is, is there bleeding? Are there hemotoxic symptoms that the patient is having? And the, if there is bleeding uh, from from any orifice. Then uh, or any hemotoxic other symptoms, then yes, ASV is definitely indicated. And uh, how to manage cases with normal? Again, a similar answer to it, that uh, we will look at all whatever the symptoms are. That see normal WBCT and no CNS sign. So, so again, are we talking about Russell's Viper? That is. Uh, that's supposed to cause some neurotox neuro uh, toxic symptoms as well because normal wbct is there so the first thing that should come in that it might not be a hemotoxic but if there are no cns signs but then so what kind of signs are there so just it is progressive local swelling it is a sign of hemotoxic bite only so uh, if the swelling is localized like savitri said that you have to mark it with say a pencil or a pen and if the swelling is localized then perhaps there is no need to give a uh, anti snake venom however the, if the swelling is progressive then it is a definite indication for giving anti snake venom so perhaps you can just mark it with a pencil to see and progressive swelling does uh, need anti snake venom and what analgesic is to be given analgesic yeah. Yeah, you can go on. Usually, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, no analgesic is indicated, and uh, even we are not advocating like currently whatever trainings we are taking for the medical officers. So we are not uh, uh, giving or even telling the medical officers to give any analgesic. And uh, specifically, the NSAIDs are like totally contraindicated. They should not be given at all. And uh, uh, so it's just. Focus on the ASV. I know uh, it's, it's difficult, but we had a discussion on the same same topic uh, with with uh, Dr. Bhavaskar sir, and he said the same thing that uh, at this point of time we are only focused on uh, getting the venom neutralized, and so apart from that we should not focus on 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 the NLGC part. So uh, in currently I I would also uh, tell this that. Uh, out of the two studies that we are currently doing and the results of those two studies, they would be used in revising the standard treatment guidelines again, because the standard treatment guidelines have been uh, uh, designed in 2016, 2017. So it's five years now. And uh, so whatever evidence we are trying to create is for modifying the national standard treatment, standard snake bite uh, treatment protocol, as well as the standard treatment guidelines. So, and we hope to have uh, new guidelines uh, by the, say mid next year and uh, we are also in the process of creating very simple flowcharts and for the management of snake bites so that includes uh, the dosing of asv as well as the management of anaphylaxis whether uh, analgesics and everything everything is there so we have prepared already prepared those flowcharts and we have a technical advisory committee and uh, we have sent those flowcharts to the technical advisory committee that consists of national experts uh, who would be revising that. And once they are approved, so those flowcharts would be available. Uh, we would make sure that those flowcharts are available at every PHC or every public health uh, facility uh, in the country. So say in a matter of, uh, say, a couple of months, at least the IEC material as well as the flowcharts would be available. So once uh, they are, then we would certainly distribute in this group also. That was yeah. a detailed answer. Thank you. Yeah. And, and also one thing I wanted to add is yeah. there is uh, the CMC protocol also, which yeah. CMC has its own IMCU guidelines. Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, what do you comment on that? Sometimes we use that because they recommend, I think, two vials, not 10. Yes, yes. As far yes. as I remember. If you add a note about yeah. that. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and, uh, it was initially 
actually for me also it was uh, quite confusing because on on one side we had the national the standard treatment guidelines which said 10 vials and even the national experts when we talked they were saying that uh, no less than 10 vials had to be given but uh, at the practice level itself uh, some doctors told us that they followed the cmc protocol which suggested about two vials three vials four vials whatever and uh, so from our point or uh, from from a protocol point of view i would suggest that uh, we saw how much venom uh, is injected uh, savitri told us about that at the same time you also know that uh, how much venom can be neutralized by by each vial of asv so for Hello. for the for the common thread for example i think it is point point uh, uh, 0.45 mg of uh, the common thread venom that is neutralized per vial so so if even if the 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 yield or whatever the the venom injected is around 6 mg and uh, per vial it is right uh, savitri would correct me if i am wrong so 0.45 and uh, so we have to calculate according to that and if you are only giving three vials or four vials then definitely that won't be able to neutralize all the venom that has been injected if it's of course it is a dry by then two three vials would be enough but uh, because that won't uh, venom won't be that much but uh, in case of a uh, uh, sometimes a crate by two times also uh, last week only we had this case in shahapur where a two year old girl was bitten by a crate twice and uh, she was given five vials of asv but she couldn't survive so i guess we'll uh, stick to the 10 vial protocol at this point of time yeah that's helpful because this is a dilemma which when i work also yes on, so... yes even sometimes even the asv availability is an issue that at many places asv availability is an issue especially in rural areas if the asv is not available at the phc then that that creates an issue and so this people are the health system people are forced to give less vials of asv because then they need to have some in, in the stock for the other patients uh, in the future so that is also one reason that uh, perhaps sometimes less vials are given definitely i think that all of us will take that in mind better to be following the national protocol since it has you know more capacity to neutralize the yeah yes, yes. And, uh, so we have scheduled our session till 8:30 i think we can take two more questions if that's okay rishikesh uh, uh yeah fine yeah yeah i think they are already in the chat box okay okay can a person, person pull up the chat thing after cobra bhai this was important recently uh, news saying the same okay mm-hmm. we'll have to see whether the person collapses uh, mostly person collapses after cobra bhai because of anxiety and uh, there is no it is very difficult to say that cobra bhai to ke baad immediately the person would have symptoms and collapse so mostly it is the anxiety that he have we even uh, at our uh, some interviews in uh, in odisha uh, people have told that uh, a cobra especially uh, in those places they have the monocelate cobra which is more venomous so than 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 the one which is found in in thane or or in, in gadchiruli also so <clears throat> so the uh, so those cobras usually people even though people worship the cobra they still fear it and so i think if it's a news then i would take it with a pinch of salt because uh, we don't want any sensationalization of anything so the only reason that a person might collapse after cobra bite is the anxiety and the fear but apart from that i have not read about or not even discussed that there has there is any pathological reason for that the is 
okay so this might happen and uh, yes so no, uh, please yeah sorry sorry please continue hello hello yeah rishikesh you can continue answering that question yes 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 so uh, two very specific cases uh, uh, we have seen one in shahapur and uh, one near bhubaneswar who had a similar kind of thing and uh, the next thing that was suggested so there are two two ways so one which was suggested by uh, dr uh, bavaskar which was the use of steroids that has to be done at at this point of time and the other one was suggested by dr uh, dayal bandhu majumdar he says that there is some time and we have to wait still and uh, after that that because there is a possibility that this might be a delayed reaction to the asv and so uh, they might come down after certain point of time but still but if does not then it again we have to resort to the uh, use of steroids so ultimately both have said that it has to be the use of steroids and like uh, savitri said that perhaps hydrocortisone uh, uh, might not be a good choice because uh, there is little evidence to say that hydrocortisone can be of uh, much use so i think dexamethasone would be the drug of choice thank you thank you so much rishikesh yes and uh, savitri had to leave early so i really okay. thank savitri and rishikesh for you know uh, giving this presentation it was really helpful to all of us and uh, if there are any questions that you would yeah. like to ask we will share a google document in the group maybe you can ask yes. a question and then uh, we will definitely respond in a few days and yes. we are very glad that we got you rishikesh someone working in icmr to in you know snake bite to help us with the session so yes. to this is our was first a pleasure. yeah this was our first trial and we are really happy and thanks to everyone who is here who attended the session yeah. for believing in us so as we said there is a learning series and uh, yes. we are also learning with every session so yes. next session will be by dr srinathi and uh, it will be uh, approach to fever and since fever cannot be taken in one a uh, session we will be splitting it in either two or three based on the endemic regions and how to approach and then we are coming up with topics whatever you need is essential please dm us and also we'll share a google doc feedback form and uh, you can come you know you can reach us and tell us what can be done and how this can be you know made better so thanks to everyone who is here and thanks to juda who helped us with uh, streaming you know both uh, zoom and youtube this will be available on youtube as well if anyone wants to access it can access it anytime and we'll come back with the documents also thank you thanks everyone thank you so much thank you is there a possibility that we can have all these uh, questions in the chat box as well so we can in the document so that perhaps we can also answer this again so we can have a sort of a report of it and then we can circulate that also yeah that was the aim uh, i think i think janvi has written down all the questions so yes, maybe yes, i have all the questions okay that's that's what so we will come back to you yeah. and savitri again to yes yes no, because when if, if we write them down then perhaps they would be more informative it was a good session thank you mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much yeah, yeah. okay bye bye bye, -bye.